So welcome everyone. Uh, uh, so today we have a special guest joining the conversations of change series of uh, Climate Asia, uh, Raj Mariwala, the director at uh, Mariwala Health Initiative. I'll start with an introduction to our speaker and then we'll get into the conversation. Uh, Raj Mariwala is a director at uh, Mariwala Health Initiative, an advocacy, capacity building and grant making organization focusing on accessible mental health for marginalized communities. Currently, Raj is also a board member of Pacham, a nonprofit uh, that works with young marginalized women on human rights, equity, and social justice. Raj is also practicing canine and feline behaviorists. Uh, welcome, Raj. So let's get started. So what we would like to start with uh, in this conversation is to know more about a typical day of yours as director of Mariwala Health Initiative and if you could also describe the work that is done at this initiative. Sure. Um, first of all, thank you so much for having me on this podcast. Uh, it's a topic that's very dear to my heart. But anyway, a typical day for me. Now, Mariwala Health Initiative is a personal um, family philanthropy, uh, and it does grant making, advocacy, and capacity building on mental health. Um, and we focus on making mental health accessible to marginalized persons and communities by fostering environments of affirmative, rights-based, and user-centric mental health care. Uh, so the programs that we support or run have a very strong focus on community-based grassroots interventions where support uh, and services are provided not just by experts, but also by trained individuals from within the community. Uh, so in a typical day, currently MHI works with 33 partners across 38 projects in 20 states. And this could be in a variety of contexts, in rural areas, in urban informal settlements, hilly regions, regions uh, facing some conflict such as Manipur, and some of the communities that we work with are farmers, victims of violence, LGBTQIA communities, youth, persons who are incarcerated in mental health institutions, homeless folks, and uh, religious minority communities. Uh, and so a day for me typically looks like focusing on the other area that MHI works on, which is advocacy with multiple sectors. Now this could be with government uh, to implement laws related to mental health care or mental health provisions, but also some technicalities such as training, judiciary, ministries and police on mental health legislations. And similarly so with uh, advocacy towards other development sector actors such as funders, NGOs on the importance of either including mental health as part of their programs or starting some new work on mental health. Uh, so in a day, typically I, I will do some thought pieces, maybe around mental health. I do a lot of writing. I also personally handle our annual journal called Reframe, which we'll talk about a little bit. Um, and I also work on one of our big training programs called Queer Affirmative Counseling Practice, uh, which is a course for mental health professionals on queer trans mental health. Uh, and currently we've trained about 500 mental health practitioners through India uh, on the topic. Thanks, Raj. It's quite an amazing uh, 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 spread of work uh, under MHI. And uh, in addition to being uh, a director at uh, the initiative, you also practice being a canine and feline behaviorist. And you're also on the board of uh, an important nonprofit, Pacham. Uh, so how has your experience been working in so many different spaces and how do you manage working with so many different communities and spaces? So I would have to say that um, MHI, first of all, has come third in, in terms of these three places. So that's it's my kind of newest type of work. Uh, but in terms of the other spaces, working with animals um, has been very close to my heart. Uh, and... I think it actually gives me quite a few unique lenses with which to work on mental health as well. Um, so say for example, uh, 
the whole idea of human animal interaction engagement in urban spaces what happens with stray dogs or stray cats uh, what sort of human behaviors uh, create changes in their population and their behaviors uh, quite recently i uh, spoke to a journalist about the effect of heat waves on stray dogs behavior so i think um, actually working in these disparate areas has really um, helped me work better on mental health uh, but in terms of passion i absolutely love working in a variety of spaces also because i think all these spaces in the end are connected to each other honestly uh, parcham started out as essentially young girls playing football in mumbra which is just a little outside of bombay uh, and the whole idea of taking up public space for girls uh, and please note the word public that comes before space um, and how hard that is what a struggle that may be um, to years later getting a dedicated ground so that young girls can play football can play cricket and you know visibilize being themselves in more public spaces so i, I think i have been actually very lucky uh, to learn from all of these spaces and of course i have used uh, the variety of spaces to for example run courses uh, in mhi for mental health professionals on how to include animals in their therapy practice uh, or i've done research my own personal research on the mental health concerns of those who work with animals so i i do find all these areas quite uh, heavily interlinked uh, not to mention that it's also given me a chance to do uh, in my free time i do a lot of work on wild bird rescue personally um and this is in the urban area of bombay which you would be surprised has so many uh, wild birds and i typically on any given day will have either a kite or a kingfisher owls in in an enclosure that i've built for them nurse them back to help with doctors and then release them when they are ready so yeah all of these are connected in my opinion true i i think this is very rare to find uh, you know to be working in such intersections and unfortunately not many people are uh, uh, you know working in such spaces uh, most of our audiences uh, of climate asia are also young professionals and many of them are looking towards joining climate action uh, taking up a climate action as a career and most of them are exploring and uh, we would like to know more from you in terms of uh, how you would describe the intersection of climate justice and mental health and if you could also uh, give a little bit of advice on how one can look at this space uh, you know to look for careers and work right so uh, i think to explore this topic uh, i'll take the mental health route first and say that there is much that influences our mental health now part of that is the contexts that we live in our social environmental physical uh, spaces now once we acknowledge this we know that there is a direct link to climate right uh, and so it's even though you know conversations around climate change have just started happening quite nascent in fact we do know that certain marginalized communities have been facing the brunt of climate events for at least the last 15 to 20 years we need to look no farther than uh, you know issues of farmers in this country whether it is drought whether it is unseasonal rainfall i mean climate has always been there uh, but the the problem comes in when our systems and our policies are unable to adequately engage in order to be able to have people be safe secure pursuing their livelihoods and accessing their human rights so for me climate justice uh, i don't think it's a new topic unfortunately it seems nascent uh, because we've only started having these conversations because they are affecting people in power so much more now 
uh, but I mean, there is, there have always been natural disasters, but what makes it a disaster is our response to it. Whether it's in terms of policies, government systems, how our lives are organized, uh, what sort of priorities um, companies, the state, society may have for us. So I think for younger people, it's very important to look and see that, um, you know, there has always been a historical engagement with this. Uh, even if we look at the Chipko movement, I think we will find that younger people have done it for many, many years. And of course, it is becoming, it's hard to find a career in it so as to speak. But I would go back to history, I would go back to intersections, and I would focus on the idea that, you know, nature does what nature does. Uh, but it's our responses, the way that our systems are set up, that cause something to be a disaster or not to be a disaster. I don't know if I answered your question. No, uh, you definitely did. In fact, uh, uh, we also sometimes uh, uh, encounter the queries and questions from youngsters uh, to not just look at everything as a career or a professional engagement, but, but this is larger than life problem that we everyone's facing on this planet. So I think you have definitely answered it. Um, so I think like you mentioned, the heat, heat waves are already here and cold waves are already here and it definitely impacts a lot of marginalized communities. Uh, in, in your experience of working with these communities, like as an upliftment of those communities to be able to making them more resilient or uh, helping them uh, probably to have less, uh, you know, affected by these impacts. So what could be done? What immediate steps organizations and nonprofits and social enterprises and even the larger ecosystem can take? So, you know, as you said, uh, working on some of these rights-based issues is long-term. So for me, one is to actually recognize uh, the approach or the lens that we take to this uh, that A, it is a right to be, you know, safe, secure, have shelter, have education, um, have a livelihood. And then what do we do? How do we equip communities? So I'm a very strong believer in the power of the community. And perhaps um, I can answer this question best with an example. Uh, now, Cyclone Funny um, happened in Odisha a while ago. And overall, that area of Odisha does see quite a few weather-related events. What do we do when communities live in locations uh, that may experience such events regularly? How do we build the capacity of these communities um, to actually, I guess, engage with such events? Uh, and the answer is uh, what we had done with one of our partners is we, we set up um, a community training where we trained young people and volunteers from within the community to set up systems of social support, social care, who is going to do X, Y, Z, who may be able to help this elderly person living in this location to get to safety, who is going to help everyone once the weather event has passed to fill out the forms, to fill out other things that are required for relief. Um, because typically what happens in such disasters, if you're looking just at climate disasters, is the disaster hits, everything is in disarray, social systems are down, government may airlift, may get in people from outside to help rebuild. Uh, but of course, they don't know what the issues of the community are, they don't know the intricacies. Right, they don't know that um, there is this one senior citizen who is living on her own and she maybe hasn't gotten help. Who's best placed to know that and who is best placed to rebuild? And can we have a system in place so that we know exactly what to do? So that care is gotten, support is gotten in a timely, appropriate fashion. Um, and of course, there is a reading on this. I wrote a paper on it. Um, and apart from that, also, it's not just about your, you know, social legal rights, it's also about mental health support. So we did train volunteers to provide 
a basic mental health support as well, uh, because mental health is another aspect of disaster relief that is uh, actually quite hidden. So I'll stop there and I can share the resource for you later. Uh, that'll be great. Uh, uh, in fact, I think you mentioned about the reframe uh, 2022 already. So uh, tell us more about what, what has been the motivation behind it and how does this platform uh, help different sections? So Reframe is MHI's annual journal, and I decided to start it in 2018 because um, I thought it's very important that we share the work we do transparently with the communities that we hope to serve. Um, and then I realized that I've never read an annual report in my life, and they are too boring. Um, so while we do publish our work, uh, we also have a bunch of thought pieces uh, from all over the country. So Reframe 2022, focuses on the theme of climate justice and mental health um, because there is, I think, so much um, in common that both of these themes have together. Uh, where, where um, So say, for example, whether it's expert-led talk on both topics only or the idea that it's an individual phenomenon um, in mental health that, you know, there must be something wrong with you or individually, what do we do about climate change? Is it only about taking a cycle to work or using less plastic? Uh, that's not going to cut it. So, and of course, I have to say in the development sector and the climate justice sector, uh, so much around this topic comes from the global North rather than from the global South. And it's very important that our voices are put out there. Totally. Uh, in fact, we would love to uh, put it on our uh, community platform to be able to, you know, for all of our audience to access this. Uh, and uh, in your opinion, uh, if you can also expand on how these conversations around mental health and therapeutic care uh, can go from clinical rooms to sort of you know, broader themes of intersections with livelihood, public health, climate justice. So since I wrote that, I better have an answer for you, <laughs> and I do. Um, I think one is, again, I'm a big believer in having the correct perspective or lens. Unless we don't have an intersectional rights-based lens, we are not going to get to these spaces. Um, the second thing is in curricula itself, especially when it comes to, I think, both mental health and uh, climate change, whose voices are being heard um, are the ones who are the most affected, foregrounded in our approaches, are our programs designed, keeping them at the center, rather than keeping at the center, the people who live in the fancier place in Bangalore, right? Um, and we saw that recently with the floods. Uh, the other thing is really, you know, putting, uh, I think, resources, policy, and other things behind communities themselves and overall policy taking such a lens so as to foreground rights of people and policy changes that are then required. Uh, I mean, so much of what we are seeing today, Joshimath and other places are due to some faulty policy decisions or neoliberal economic imperatives. Um, so these are some of the things that need to change and finally, I would say that philanthropy has a big role to play in this because I'm coming from that field, um, that we can't see things in silos. A very famous activist has said that, you know, we don't live single issue lives. So why are we, you know, putting things in these different little boxes? There is so much connect between livelihoods, public health care, and of course, clinician rooms. But uh, we need to, I think, challenge expert-led views around them. Yeah, can't agree more about the interconnectedness and how everything's connected. And uh, uh, thanks for sharing that. And uh, Raj, we would also uh, like to know about your own uh, life and work balance that we generally talk about, right? Like with enormous responsibilities and so many spaces that you're part of. Like, how do you manage your work-life balance, uh, and how do you unwind unwind from the work? 
So this is a very hard question for me because I don't think I do it well. I'm not definitely not a good role model for this. Um, but I would say, you know, at, at I would, in 2013 or 2014, I sat down and I said, what are the things that I do that I need to cut out of my life so that I can do only two or three things and not, you know, completely fizzle out. And so I did cut out a few things from my life, but uh, there's still a lot that I do. Um, and some of it is daily practice, um, such as for one hour a day, I will spend time without any animals around me. And I do have, I have uh, 10 cats and two dogs and usually some birds. Uh, and so that's quite important because it is work related and mostly people tend to say, oh, how can, you know, animals are such a stress buster. Uh, but I think you need to be conscious about the work that you do, especially when you're passionate about it, it's very easy to kind of get carried away and continue working. Uh, but you never want to end up at a point where the work doesn't excite you anymore. Um, so I do consciously do things like this. I also try to plan my life and do some boundary setting around all my work. But in terms of, uh, Unwinding, I'd say it's easiest for me to pick one thing in which I can shut out everything around me, something such as pottery, it may be, you know, painting for other people uh, and just do that so that, you know, my mind is kind of empty for that moment. Uh, but yeah, I'm, I'm probably not the best person to talk about uh, unwinding. So that that's that's a great advice to you know to shut out a lot of things and just focus on uh, something at a time and i think yeah that's valuable and uh, are you reading something currently what 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 is a book that you would recommend for our audience to uh, read and also or probably a media recommendation a movie or something so um i i do love reading and um, you know i was thinking about a book, I, I haven't um, read it recently, but I think it would be interesting for your audience to read. Uh, so there is a fabulous um, academic called Farhana Sultana, and she's written a book in 2020 called Water Politics, Governance, Justice, and the Right to Water. Um, and I found it a fabulous book, but I think if you don't want to um, buy this book, I would suggest that you read a free to access paper that she's written, um, which is called, I think, Progress in Political Ecology from Margin to Center. Um, and there are quite a few learnings and like fabulous ideas in it. Uh, in terms of movies, unfortunately, I have not seen many or really any lately. So um, in terms of podcast, I would suggest IDR, uh, which is an Indian podcast. Uh, it's called On the Contrary, and it has a lot about the development field that I find exciting and interesting. All right. Thank you so much, Raj. It's been a, uh, it's been a pleasure having this conversation with you. And I hope uh, all our audience, a lot of young people find it very inspiring. Uh, thank you so much for spending time with us today. Thank you.